right, ladies and gentlemen. So let's go ahead and start the demonstration. I'm going to save. There's some questions that were coming in, but I want to save those for the end of the webinar. Um, I should introduce myself. My name is Dan Hughes. I was the webinar trainer for Nick Software from 2009 until uh, February of 2014. Uh, after the, the Google purchase, I uh, actually went up to Google and worked for them for about a year and a half, both on the Nick collection and on some other really cool projects. And um, since then, I've actually moved from California over to Rochester, New York, and I teach photography at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, that's my full-time gig. And I uh, have some time in the summer to give these webinars, and hopefully I'll be continuing to do that throughout the school year now that we've gotten these things started, because I'm having a lot of fun giving these webinars. Um, tonight is the, my last webinar of the month, but uh, Joseph Lenashki has a couple more webinars, um, and he's he has smartly planned the same demonstration several times. Uh, I tend to just give mine once and then create a whole new demonstration, which isn't that effective or, well, probably effective, but probably not as efficient. Uh, Joseph wow, offers the opportunity uh, for several uh, different visits for the same demonstration. Anyways, make sure to stop by one of Joseph's demonstrations. Um, we're going to be getting a schedule out for July and hopefully August very soon, and uh, come back and see us after this demonstration. Now, I'm going to minimize the website here. And uh, we're going to be talking about landscape photography. Uh, that, you know, that's a broad kind of photography. And I've kind of got, I would say, mostly, if you will, traditional kinds of photography. This is an infrared photograph from Arches National Park in Utah. And uh, it's an infrared image. I, I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned that just a second ago, because I was sort of looking at the photo. And um, I want to talk about how I would use Silver Effects Pro to convert this image from the false color infrared to black and white. And then what we're gonna be doing is sort of transitioning into some different pieces of software, focusing on adjusting images that are landscape photographs. Um, and I wanna launch the software, I'm gonna want launch the Nick collection from DxO, both in Photoshop this evening, and then also in Photo Labs 2 to um, update anybody who, who isn't already familiar with that and talk about the workflow in that realm, in that regard. Um, one of the beauties of purchasing the Nick Collection 2 by DxO now is that you actually get a copy of Photo Lab 2 uh, Essentials, which is a proprietary raw processing software. I'll, I'll show you that probably 20 minutes or half hour into the show, and uh, we'll talk about how you can integrate that into your workflow potentially. Uh, what I am finding are incredibly powerful are the control points, the U-point technology that's built into the raw processing software. It's incredible. Anyways. We'll get to that. So here we've got our photograph. Uh, my palette's kind of covering it up a little bit, but um, not the most important part. Uh, it's, so it's just over here. Anyways, this is a slightly underexposed infrared photo. Um, I've, I've processed this image using Adobe Camera Raw. In this case, I cropped it to this sort of strange uh, aspect ratio, which emulates my Hasselblad X-Pan camera. And uh, I just like the, the, the format. And so I cropped this one to fit that. And uh, the thing that I started off with after doing my raw processing is I did what's called a channel swap. For those of you who are familiar with infrared photography, this is a, a common technique uh, where you, we swap the green and the red channel. Nope, sorry, the blue and the red channel. Um, and it gives us this kind of effect. And then we're going to take this image into silver effects and create something similar to this. So let's let's get started on that. And the the fact that this is infrared doesn't really matter. I just like to point that out because it's kind of fun. Uh, and I am headed to Chicago next week and plan to bring my infrared camera. So hopefully this will get me uh, my, my juices going, if you will. Now, what I did is I used the Nick Selective tool in Photoshop. I'll mention what that is in another few minutes once we go back over into Photoshop again. Um, it's the palette. It's how you launch the software. At least it's one of the two ways to launch the software. Um, and now we're within Silver Effects Pro 2. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I know we have a wide swath of folks, some of which, some of you are, are very experienced with the Nick Collection. Some folks, maybe you've never really seen it before. Uh, I want to try and aim the webinar to, to fit everybody, but we're not going to be able to cover every single thing, and I'm not going to be able to talk about every single aspect of the software, unfortunately. I just want to talk about some solutions um, that I find are helpful 
in landscape photography when when processing post processing my my landscape images. Uh, so I've launched Silver Effects Pro 2. There are 48 presets built into the software. Uh, there are 10 brand new presets that are built into the software now called the Envogue presets. I don't think I'm going to use any of them on this particular image, but what's great about this is that we have 48 different, completely different opportunities. Meaning as I scroll through these presets here, I can see what my image would look like. I don't even have to click on it. I can just see the little icon on the left side. Um, and, and get a feel for what my image might look like if I'm just going to use one of these presets. Uh, the, the, my interest in this is that I get to see the potential of my image, and then I also don't necessarily have to know every single thing about the software to get really fantastic results, because I can start with this contrasty preset and then move over into the tools palette on the right and start making adjustments uh, to the image to sort of fine tune it. In, in this case, I think I like the more silver preset here. I like the mood that it's giving me. It's kind of darkening down the image a little bit and adding some contrast, and there's some depth now. Um, in fact, to take a, a quick look at the before and after, if you follow my cursor to the upper sort of left quadrant of the uh, interface here, I'm gonna press and hold the compare button. This is gonna show you the original black and white conversion. As I let go of the compare button, you'll see the enhanced version. You can see it's, it's actually, not highly transformative, but we are getting a lot more depth out of the photograph just simply by clicking on that more silver preset. I'm into it, I like what's going on there. Uh, from here, what I wanna do is kind of sculpt the light, right? There are some details here that we're losing. There's some textures in, in portions of the images that I wanna, or the image that I wanna bring out. And I wanna direct your attention as the viewer towards some important areas in the image. And uh, to do that, we're gonna make adjustments globally which we've done primarily with this preset. And then we're gonna go in with control points and start to dodge and burn and selectively adjust the photo. Um, the first thing that I'm gonna do right now is go into my global adjustments and I'm gonna open up the structure tool. Structure, for anyone not familiar, is basically a texture adjustment. In fact, I'm gonna hide the tools palette on the left side here just by clicking that little button. Um, and I'm gonna zoom in. So tapping the space bar on my keyboard zooms us in. And uh, just to show you what the structure tool is gonna do here, this is a good example to show structure as well. Uh, I kind of wish I had even some more different kinds of textures, but we've got sort of these high frequency areas of um, the grass, of the um, scrub and stuff, and then the red rocks, and then the clouds. So if I take my structure slider up into the right, I'm gonna be basically increasing the texture in the image. What it's doing is it's amplifying any of these small textures in the photo. And I would say probably at 100%, it's way too much structure. Uh, I can start to see some other uh, issues sort of cropping up now. So what I might do is just add a little bit of structure globally over, overall, and then using control points, I can, I can specifically add texture using the structure tool in areas that I wanna kind of attract your eye. And I can remove structure from areas where I don't want you to be looking so much. And that's gonna to help to kind of direct uh, the viewer's attention through the image. Uh, so I am gonna go ahead in my highlight structure. Let's see what happens. If I bring this slider all the way up into the right, basically anything that's a highlight, anything that's on the right side of the histogram is going to have um, a, a massive amount of texture added to it. I'm not actually seeing much, if any, there's a little bit, and, and what's happening is if you look at the histogram in the lower right corner here, I don't really have much stuff on the right side of the histogram. Uh, but as I bring my highlights structure slider up, you can see in the histogram, it'll actually shift a little bit. It's just shifted up. Um, and in the very brightest values, I'm starting to separate those sections. And I really like what's happening there. In fact, I am probably going to leave the highlight slider at a, at 95% for the for the highlight structure tool. Watch what happens though. Sliding it to the left, we're removing all that structure. Sliding to the right, we're increasing that structure, that texture. And what I'm I'm enjoying about that, or what I think is effective in this case, is uh, the the fact that I can get a little more contrast out of those very brightest values. Um, now I've jumped into the brightness sliders. By the way. Anytime you see a little triangle, a little uh, twirler, as we would call them, um, to the left of a label, 
you just click on that label or on the twirler itself and it's typically going to open up into another tools palette for you um, under brightness we have the ability to adjust the overall brightness the highlights midtones shadows and uh, the dynamic brightness as well so i'm going to increase the highlight brightness just a little bit you can see in my histogram very slightly that's this those details on the right side are starting to kind of creep back up into the uh, the brightest values there um, i'm going to also tap the space bar it's going to zoom us back out i like the texture that we've added now but as i sort of lean back in my chair i realize that i'm i'm sort of bringing out some textures over here on this side and this is becoming distracting and then i also want to see if i can get a little bit of texture out of the very darkest uh, shadows here on the not lit side of these rocks. So what we're going to do is just jump right in with control points. This is probably the most important tool built into any of the NIC plugins. Uh, it's U-Point technology and it allows us to selectively control different portions of the image or objects in the image. In Silver SilverFX Pro, we have a an adjustment control point and the adjustment control point by default allows you to control brightness, contrast, and structure. If you click on the little twirler, it's kind of hard to see in that area, but there's a little twirler that's at the bottom of each control point. If you click on it, it opens up into amplify whites, amplify blacks, fine structure, and then selective colorization. If you have a black and white image where you want to have, let's say, a spot of color, you can use that bottom slider there. Now, uh, I want to place the control point over in the corner, and I'm just going to go ahead and burn that whole side down. And as I do that, I'm noticing that I'm actually darkening down the clouds probably more than I really want to. In fact, I'll take that brightness slider to the to left a lot. And, and this is nice in terms of it's directing my attention towards the right, but I don't want this control point to be affecting the clouds here which I'll talk about how these control points are making their selections. Uh, but for now, what I want to do is use a um, another control point to basically make the first control point smarter. Uh, this, is, this is, as you add more control points, each control point can figure out what you're trying to adjust. Because as you drop a control point, what's happening is the point is looking for similar tones, colors, and textures to the whatever you've placed that point on. And in this case, now that I've placed the point on the clouds, this control point is going to say, okay, whatever you do to these sliders, it's gonna affect just the cloud area. And now this control point, the first one that we placed on the left side, it's gonna recognize that there's another point up here and that it should not, this first control point, should not be affecting the clouds anymore. In fact, uh, watch what happens if I just click on that second control point and drag it away. This control point takes that stuff over again. As I place this point over in the clouds, it's gonna clean up that selection for me. And I like this a lot because now I'm able to darken down um, you know, different portions of the, the rock formation here, very specifically, basically by adding as many control points as I might need to. Uh, place one here. Now I've got some nice contrast in there, but still too much. I'm gonna darken that down. And I've kind of lessened the contrast range there on the left, maybe more than I need to, uh, but what that's going to really help me to do is direct your eye as the viewer into the middle of the image, which is my intention in this case. Uh, now, so that I'm not talking about this one image all night, and we, we basically are getting into and understanding how control points work, um, I'm going to just add a couple control points here and there, and then add a finishing adjustment. Watch, so I'm gonna zoom in here at the space bar, use my navigator in the upper right. Um, the camera did a pretty good job to pick up some of the texture here. I don't necessarily think I need that much though. So I'm gonna bring the brightness back down and I'm gonna take um, my structure slider and I'm gonna bump that up just a little bit. And I'm gonna take my amplify whites and I'm gonna bump that up just a little bit. And now what I'm getting out of this is you know, shadow detail, basically textures in that rock. And so if I were to go to print this photo or if I were to post it on the web somewhere, rather than that being completely black, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, rather than it being completely black and dark with no detail, I can basically use these control points to make sure I get the uh, overall look and feel that I'm interested in. So I zoom back out. Yeah, I like that. That's balanced nicely. 
we've got some detail, but it's not too much. Um, I think from here, let's just take a quick look at the before and after. I might just finish this image with uh, a finishing adjustment, the the toning, the, the <laughs> maybe even a, a, wow, a cross tone? I can't remember my term now. Sorry. Hang on. Here's the before. Here's the after. I love what we've got in terms of texture. I want to add a little bit more depth. And so I'm going to use the toning tool in the finishing adjustment section here within Silver Effects Pro 2. Uh, and in Silver Effects Pro 2, you've got like 24 different presets built in. And these are color toning presets. Um, I'm going to do what's called a split toner. That was the term I was looking for a little while ago. And that is I'm going to start with the Selenium Tone preset. And then I'm going to click into the toning section there on the right side. And I'm going to set, I'm going to increase my strength so this is a little more noticeable. I'm not going to leave this uh, image this blue, but basically I'm going to bring the strength up so we can see what's happening. You see, with the toning section here, the silver hue is going to affect the darkest values in the image, and the paper hue is going to affect the brightest values in the image. So if I take my paper hue over to like yellow or orange or a tone that's a little bit warmer than blue, uh, what I'm going to end up with here is this nice sort of split colorization, split coloring of uh, our image. And again, it's too strong right now, but as I finagle the balance a little bit and then I take the overall strength down, we're going to end up with uh, these, these cool shadows, blue shadows, which is going to recede into the background, and we're going to have these warm highlights, and that's going to sort of pop it's going to come forward in the foreground. And so rather than adding contrast in terms of luminosity contrast to you know continue to brighten these highlights and darken those shadows, by adding a split toning effect like this, I'm able to get a little bit more depth, a little bit more pop, and, and a little bit more sort of oomph, if you will, which is what I'm interested in in this particular landscape image in, in my case. So um, I'm happy with the results. I like what the histogram's looking like. I'm going to go ahead and click the OK button in the lower right corner of the interface. And we've finished our first black and white conversion. At least in this case, it was a black and white conversion starting from a uh, infrared image. So we've got this nice sort of colored, toned black and white photo. Wonderful. All right, so let me take a look at the GoToWebinar control panel, make sure everybody's still good to go. We didn't have any problems or anything. Um, um, David, I'm not sure what his com what your comment was. Okay, got it. All right, so it looks like everybody's still good to go. There's no there's no problems. Um, cool. Let's keep moving. So let's go ahead and get into an HDR photo. Um, I'm not exactly sure where this was shot. This was a photograph made by a former student of mine named Mike DeCola. Uh, he's actually a 3D artist now in New York City, but he's an avid landscape photographer. It makes really good work. And uh, I want to open up our, our workflow into HDR. And then after HDR Effects Pro, I'm going to take the image into uh, Color Effects Pro after we merge these three um, images into a single HDR photo. So let's go ahead and open this up. Oops, as I close the Nick Selective tool. Um, so <laughs> to access the software, you, you've got actually two different ways of doing this. You can go up to the filter drop down menu, down to the Nick collection, and this is going to be our, our grouping of the, the different Nick plugins. Uh, the way that I was accessing the software was using the Nick Selective tool. I actually didn't mean to close that, but if you if you ever if you open Photoshop and your Nick Selective tool doesn't come up automatically and you're interested in using the Nick Selective tool, you go up to the file drop-down menu, down to automate, and then over to the Nick Selective tool. And when you click on that, the Nick Selective tools should pop up and you should have access to your Nick plugins. If you want the Nick Selective tool to just come up automatically anytime you open up Photoshop, you can adjust that setting uh, by going into the lower left corner of the settings and you can say when Photoshop launches, it's this top option, uh, automatically open with Selective tool. So if it's not automatically doing that, it means the other setting is currently set. So I'm gonna click that OK button. It's good to go. 
All right, so let's merge these three images together. I've got them open in Photoshop right now. We've got this uh, situation where the dynamic range is wider than what the camera can actually capture. So Mike shot several exposures and then with the, with the idea of merging them together into a single photo. So to do this, I click on the Merge button in the Nick Selective tool. This should launch into a finder, basically, and this is the Source Files dialog, and what you do is just click the Add Open Files button, if you've got your files open in Photoshop already. If you don't, you click Open, and then on a Mac, your finder opens on a PC, the same thing happens, uh, just looks a little bit different than on my screen here. Uh, but uh, my files are open, so I'm going to click the Add Open Files button, and uh, what's happening now is I've got two extra files in here that we don't want. So I'm going to get rid of this file and this file by just clicking on them, so it highlights them, and I'm going to say Remove, move to the Remove side over here, and now we're just going to be launching these three source uh, raw files uh, into HDRFX Pro, which I, should, I shouldn't say raw, they are raw file formats. When we click the Merge dialog, they're actually going to be um, you know, opened into Photoshop and therefore converted into TIFF files. Uh, and so we're going to be in HDRFX Pro with our three images in the Merge dialog. Now, there is a pretty major ghosting aberration that's occurring right now because in the water, the shutter speeds are so different between the zero exposure, the middle exposure, and then the, the two stops overexposed and the two stops underexposed. But uh, what we're seeing right now in the water is a, a ghost issue, ghost artifact issue. Um, you, can, you can see that the water's super funky. And so what we're gonna do is turn on the ghost reduction tool. And as soon as you turn on the ghost reduction tool, the software chooses a ghost reference image. It's going to be by default the zero, whatever the middle exposure is. Uh, and in this case, I don't want that because you can still see there's some weird funky stuff happening in the water. So what we'll do is click on the two stops overexposed and that's gonna clean up that artifacting that was occurring. Once we've finished with that, we just click the create HDR button. And with HDRFX Pro, it launches. And the idea is that it's going to create a realistic looking high dynamic range photograph. And in this case, the, the image is probably a little more high key. It's a little brighter than what would probably have been this exposure if we could somehow create a single exposure with uh, this wide of a dynamic range. Uh, but that's neither here nor there because we've got wonderful presets that are built in. There are 40 that are built into the software, um, 12 of which are from this new series, the En Vogue uh, series of, of presets. And um, I really love what's happening with the Dark and Stormy preset. I think that maybe we're gonna reduce the method strength a little bit. And this is a highly stylized HDR image. Let's, let's actually stay away from that this time, maybe. I, I do like what's happening with a click of a button to this with this preset. Um, but let's see if we click on uh, warm deep. That's getting there. There's some weird aberrations occurring around the edges of this. And um, in fact, let's let's look at that for a second because this is happening. Oh, this is a relatively small file. It's only nine me megapixels. So you see this edge here. This is occurring because the way that the the image was captured, the the dynamic range. Of, of each individual exposure should have been shot at a, a different exposure value. Meaning, when Mike set this up, he should have shot at zero. And then in this case, because it's such a high contrast edge here from this very dark and shadow rock to the bright sky, um, possibly stopped his camera one exposure value. So changed it to one exposure value and then went to two. And what I think he did is he went from zero to plus two and then from zero to negative two and two thirds. And I think that's what's occurring here is we're getting this aberration. Um, we, we can fix this basically by reducing um, some of the kind of HDR effects, the method strength and the tone compensation. But I think if I actually just use a different preset, we're not gonna see that so much. It's not gonna be such a big deal. Uh, but but that that is just pertaining to the way that this HDR image was captured. Um, so in tone compression, 
Under the Details section, I want the image to look a little bit more realistic, so I'm going to go to the realistic setting in the detail area here of tone compression. Mind you, if your uh, HDR software doesn't open up with the HDR method tool open, you just click on that little twirler. opens right up. All right. And actually, we have a grainy drama setting but I think it works well here. What, what's not working really well for me is the kind of green color cast that's occurring in the shadows. And I think that that's occurring because in the preset, or sorry, in the levels and curves, uh, there might be a little bit of a curve adjustment. No, there isn't. There is, but not in the green channel. So here I'm exploring for that. But what we can do is go into the green channel, move into the shadow detail. So I'm gonna just place a point in the midtones and then I can go into my shadows and I can maybe warm them up just a smidge so they're not so green. There we go. I'm happy with that. I've got I've sort of fixed my color up a little bit. And then from here, it's just a matter of toning the image. I like the overall look and feel with this preset, uh, but I want the shadows to actually be in shadow. So I'm gonna darken down these rocks a little bit. And uh, when working in HDR Effects Pro, we of course have the ability to access all of the information that we've merged the images together with. Meaning, I have the very bright values, I have the very dark values, and the software is gonna be able to access and adjust that. So these control points are dealing with 32 bit per channel of information, which means I can access and adjust you know, all of these values very quickly and easily, basically. And uh, I'm gonna just darken down this edge and reduce a little bit of contrast. And I'm gonna say I'm happy with this result. Actually, I'm not gonna be happy with that result. I wanna remove uh, some structure from the sky, darken down the sky a little bit. There we go. Get a nice blue sky in there. Let's just take a quick look at the before and after with the compare button. So there's the original HDR merge. We clicked on the warm texture preset. I adjusted the shadow color a little bit. Um, I'm noticing that I actually want this corner to go a little bit darker as well. And maybe even reduce the contrast just a touch. Oop, that's probably too far. There we go. It's pretty good. I'm happy with that. All right, so we've got our HDR photo. Pretty stylized. It's not crazy, but kind of stylized. I'm gonna click the OK button for the sake of time so that we can get back over into Photoshop. Um, because all I've done so far with, with these workflows on these landscape images is kind of talked about using one piece of software, right? So in this case, we've used HDR Effects Pro, but after HDR Effects Pro, I will oftentimes go and use analog effects. Or if I'm converting my image, even if it's an HDR photo from color to black and white, I'll go to Silver Effects Pro and, and use that to convert the HDR image because Silver Effects Pro 2 is designed for converting color images to black and white, and there's a huge tool set that gives us really fantastic capabilities for being able to convert our color images to black and white. Now, I'm not gonna go um, highly stylized in this regard, although I do like what Clarity Bump does to this. So the Clarity Bump is a recipe that is a, a new recipe built into Color Effects Pro 4. Um, it, it came out with the En Vogue recipes, basically. And just to show you what it did, th this is the Clarity Bump, it's it's relatively subtle. Here's the before, here's the after. It kind of just brings these rocks to life nicely. I don't, I don't particularly like what's happening in the sky. Um, and in fact, here, here's, here's what we're gonna do. I wasn't even gonna work from this Clarity Bump. I was gonna kind of start over from scratch, but let's say you really like what a recipe is doing on parts of an image, but not on other parts. Uh, what you can do is, you know, you'd be happy and just go with it if you want to, or if you want to control the image a little bit more, go over to the filters set, uh, the filter stack on the right side of the interface, and figure out which filters are doing the stuff that you like to the different areas of the image, and the things that you don't like to the different areas in the image. And what I'm finding is that the pro contrast filter and the tonal contrast filter are, are adding contrast into the sky that I'm not interested in having. So what we'll do is click on tonal contrast, use a minus control point, and just place points on the areas where we don't want them. Now, for folks not familiar with color effects, 
and just getting familiar with control points, when we were within the black and white conversion software, SilverFX Pro, and when we were within HDRFX Pro, we had control points that were basically called adjustment control points. They allow you to control the, you know, the densities and the colors and the, the textures and so on um, built into those pieces of software. With ColorFX Pro 4, we don't have that kind of control point. We have plus and minus control points. The, if you follow my cursor to the right side, the plus control point, that's going to put the effect in wherever you place the point. And the minus control point is going to remove the effect from the area that you place the point on. So with the tonal contrast filter here, I don't want the effect in the sky or in the cloud, so I place minus control points there. Uh, same with the pro contrast filter. I'm going to just take a minus control point. I'm going to place it here on the sky. I'm going to expand out my area of influence. I think we had a question that came in about the circle here, the area of influence. We're not actually making a circular selection. We're making a selection inside of the circle of whatever you place the point on. So it's looking, the control point is looking for the same tone, color, and texture, among other things. And since this is a minus control point, it's removing the pro contrast filter from that area. Pardon me, I'm just going to take a sip of my water. Sorry about that. Okay, so I think I like what's going on here. Nope, I want to remove it from uh, the water down here. And if you ever want to just be sure of where the control points are working and where they're operating, with uh, all of the plugins have this same capability. In ColorFX Pro 4, uh, you access the control points list by clicking on the words control points. So every filter is going to have those words and you can control the control points of each and every individual filter. Um, and then if I want to see where the effect is and where the effect is not being applied, if you follow my cursor into the control points list, there's a, there's a little like mask button basically from Photoshop. It's, it's a little square with a circle inside of it. If you click on that, what you're going to see is anything that is white has this filter applied. So pro contrast is being applied basically 100% at anything that's white. And anything that's black doesn't have any of the effect on it. As you click on and drag your control points around, you can actually see the selection being made in real time, which to me is absolutely incredible. I, I just get a kick out of moving these control points around. Um, and this is a helpful technique for understanding how the control points are working, where they're operating and where they're working, and then what happens if you add more control points. Like if I take another minus control point and I place it in the sky here, actually got to make sure that that checkbox is on and expand this out i can see i'm not affecting the clouds anymore and that tone and color and texture i might need a couple control points to really get the effect off of that cloud if that was my intention anyways let's take a look at the before and after i kind of like what we've done here before and after sure let's leave that and let's add one more filter onto this image and that is uh the glamour glow filter and the, the Glamour Glow filter, this is not necessarily a technique, but this is a tool that I will use often um, on an HDR image, especially with, with uh, Color Effects Pro 4. After I've created the HDR image, I'll apply this Glamour Glow filter because I like what it does to the textures and the shadows primarily. Uh, in fact, if we, if we look at the before and after, oh shoot, you know what I just did? I just totally messed up. Okay, so let's back up for a second, ladies and gentlemen. I I just lost my pro contrast filter because I skipped a step when I went to add my glamour glow filter. So let's back up for a second. I'm going to move into the history browser in the lower left corner. Um, this history browser basically records every single thing that we do uh, while we're within ColorFX Pro 4. Um, several of the plugins actually have this capability, SilverFX Pro, ColorFX Pro, and HDRFX Pro. Uh, all have a history state browser so that you can control things like this. Uh, so what I need to actually do is go back a few steps. I'm going to go back to control point three, move. And then notice now I have my pro contrast filter back. What I skipped, what I accidentally did is I just added a new filter. I never clicked the add filter button. And so what happened was I replaced pro contrast with the filter that I clicked on. So I need to make sure to click the add filter button. I kind of got ahead of myself there as uh, I was trying to move quickly. So 
I clicked the add filter button and I've added in Glamour Glow. And I actually like what it's doing throughout the entire image. Oftentimes what I'll do is just add the Glamour Glow filter effect into the shadow details. Uh, and what it tends to do is it just kind of softens things up a little bit. It retains the, the nice textures in the shadows, but it just isn't as harsh to me, right? In fact, here's the before, here's the after. I basically like what it was doing at the default. Uh, I'm just gonna bring the, the glow slider up a little bit and I'm gonna take my shadow uh, retention slider. So a lot of the contrast and color control filters that are built into a Color Effects Pro 4 are gonna have the shadows and highlight protection sliders in them. And what these do, if I slide the shadow slider down to zero and I slide the highlight slider down to zero, uh, the, the goal of these sliders are re to retain highlight detail with the highlight slider and to retain shadow detail with the shadows slider. And so what it'll do is it'll kind of mute as I take the highlights to the right, it'll actually mute those highlights. It'll it'll kind of take them down a little bit, darken them back down, if the filter is affecting this. And actually you can see that it is. The glow filter, as I slide highlights back and forth, you can see how it's changing. I kind of like with the, uh, in this case, the highlights at about 50%. I'm gonna bring the shadow, how about to about 30% or so. And then I say we just finish this one off with a dark vignette around the edge and just around the bottom edge at that. So here's what we're gonna do. I click the add filter button. I'm gonna to go to the vignette lens filter. I'm gonna change my shape. Some of these filters I'm not explaining a whole lot of. I do apologize for that, but for the sake of time so that we can talk about a bunch of different things, I wanna kind of move through this relatively quickly. So what I'm doing is I've added a vignette lens filter here, and then I'm just adding control points to the corners and the areas where I want those, those uh, the effect to be. So uh, one reason why I might use the vignette lens filter in color effects, as opposed to using it within uh, HDR effects pro is because I have control point, plus and minus control points where I can tell the filter where I want it to be and where I don't want it to be. So it gives me that much more control. It seems like it would be more work it kind of is because you're adding a vignette just into particular areas, but it offers me a lot more control. And I, I do say I don't use this technique all that often. I don't like always go into a Color Effects Pro 4 to add the vignette lens so that I can just control exactly where it's going to be. But when I do only want the effect in certain areas, I will absolutely come into Color Effects Pro and I can then place my plus and minus control points in the specific areas where I do and I don't want the um, filter to be. Uh, another trick that I'm using, and I use it constantly, is I'll duplicate control points around the image. There are several ways to do that. If you press and hold, so the way that I tend to do it is by pressing and holding the Option key down, and that's Option on a Mac or Alt on a PC, and while I'm pressing and holding the Option key, I can basically just click on my point and drag it away, right? So I made like six points so far here. If I don't want any of those points, I can actually just click with my, my cursor tool and drag around them. That's going to highlight all of them, and then I can hit the delete key and I can get rid of them. Color Effects is going to warn us as well. It's going to say, are you sure you want to do that? Say yes. Okay, I like our results. So we started here, we kind of set up the image with an HDR Effects Pro, and then using the the preset from the end, sorry, the recipe from the Envogue grouping, and then adding a couple of our own filters to kind of take the edge off. We've got, as I click the OK button, a more to me realistic looking HDR image that has some nice uh, depth to it, and uh, this nice tonal range at the same time. All right, so let's take a look at the Go to Webinar Control Panel. Make sure everybody can still see my screen and hear me. Make sure I don't lose everybody. Uh, and hopefully this has been helpful. Oh, this is very frustrating. I see. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, are you? can you see my screen still? Can you hear me still? I don't think we've lost many people, but I got two people that just, uh, two people that just said that they couldn't see the screen anymore. still here. Okay. 
All right. So like I said, so there seems to be some folks who had some connection issues. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, if, if you if you do have a connection problem where my voice cuts out a whole bunch or the screen freezes and I'm not moving, like you can hear me, but you can't see the screen change or anything, um, log out of the webinar and log back in. And then also, if it's really frustrating, you will get a link to the recorded webinar um, tomorrow after 24 hours, basically. The, the, video has to process and then you get an email. Um, okay, so it looks like we're still good to go. So we've got about 15 minutes left. I wanna jump over into Photo Labs 2 and talk a little bit about using Photo Labs 2 with the NIC collection. So uh, the first thing is, is to kind of just point out for anyone who's not familiar, Photo Lab 2 is DxO's proprietary raw processing software. It is also a photo library organizational tool, and it's nice. It works kind of like, um, it, it is not a catalog-based system. So basically, however your folder structure is set up, like if I go into the upper left corner here and move into my photo library, uh, you can see my folder structure, right? And so right now we're in the 1906-20 landscape photography talk, and uh, that's what we're doing. So I'm gonna click into the customize section in the upper left corner, and uh, we're gonna start with this image. Now, the, the first thing that I'm gonna do is just launch the NIC collection from Photo Labs, and then I wanna show you a few tricks, a few things that are built into Photo Lab that uh, have helped me so far in the past uh, couple months as I've been playing with Photo Lab too. The first thing to think about is that we are dealing with raw files, right? And so uh, we have the ability to adjust white balance and exposure and, and um, DxO Clearview Plus, which is a really cool feature. Kind of brings the image to life a little bit. Really kind of a nice tool. Um, and we have all sorts of sort of, I would say, if you will, standard controls. And then there's some really nice um, smart controls like exposure compensation. And uh, the, the idea here is that we are going to be adjusting the exposure in a way that's very close to an exposure change in camera, right? So I don't necessarily need to do that on this image, but I do like the, the fact that this is sort of photographically driven and the terms work that way and the, the actions that you take as you adjust the exposure compensation, for example, gives me the look of what would happen if, if I were to change my exposure. Uh, here or there by changing the exposure in camera. All right, so I think the, the only thing I'm gonna do here is make sure that my um, distortion is on. Yep, my correction module is on. So one of the really fantastic or the most powerful parts as I open the NIC collection by clicking the NIC collection button in the lower right corner here, one of the most important parts of DxO Photo Lab is the pairing of the camera and uh, lens combination. So as you open up Photo Lab 2, what it will ask you to do is download a profile for the particular camera and lens combination that you're shooting with. Uh, and what it does is it makes corrections based upon the, that camera sensor and lens combination. And so what it should give you, what it should yield you is uh, basically perfect in terms of distortion result, and then also a really beautiful result based upon the profile that's created by DxO Mark, right? Because DxO Mark is the same company as DxO Software, and they do all of the camera and lens tests and so on and so forth. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself, kind of getting aside myself as well. This is the plugin selector here within Photo Labs 2. I'm going to click on Color Effects Pro 4. This is going to launch into Color Effects Pro 4. And I'm just gonna start from scratch on this one. The, the last image that we, we adjusted, the HDR photo, I had planned on just starting from scratch, but I kinda liked what the preset was doing, so I riffed off of that. Hopefully it was a helpful demo. And um, let's see. 17 seconds for, oh, it, didn't, it did launch, but my Color Effects Pro launched behind my photo lab. Okay, so um, let's start from scratch on this one. Oh, and I want to show you a trick. So, um, Color Effects Pro 4 is broken into 55 different filters. There are literally millions of different effects that you can get out of that because the, each filter has its own filter set in, or tools palette. And then also, depending upon the order in which you place these filters on your image, you'll get different results. 
so I, I don't have like a really good thought process as to why I adjust the way that I do. Um, I, I guess it's just from experience and playing for hours and hours and hours and hours. Uh, but what I will do if I'm experimenting with a different combination of filters is I will change the order in which they're applied. I'll literally drag them up and down in the filter stack. So I'll show you that. I know on this image, I wanna use the skylight filter. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click on the skylight filter. This is a very simple filter. There's just one slider. It's a strength slider and you can increase or decrease that skylight filter. And I love what's happening here. It really accentuates the, the sunset. And I'm gonna leave that at about 53%. From there, I'm gonna add the detail extractor filter. And I, I know what I'm gonna end up doing is I'm gonna drag the detail extractor filter up above the skylight filter and the resulting change will be only slightly different, but I think you'll actually see a difference. So anyone not familiar, the detail extractor filter is a super powerful corrective filter, which can also be used for stylistic purposes, meaning you, you can just correct the texture, to increase a little bit of texture using the detail extraction filter, or you can really hit it hard and get a lot of sort of stylistic effect out of this. Um, we're not going to leave the detail extractor at 66% in this case, but I think what you're going to see as I take the detail extractor filter and I drag it up above skylight is a change. So watch what happens as I click and drag this. So I apply it, meh, it's subtle. It's, it's only slightly different. Where I've, I've noticed a huge difference is with the application of the tonal contrast filter. And that's when, if, if I've got the tonal contrast filter at the bottom of my stack of filters, I'll just see what happens if I drag it to the very top. And I generally, work, I'm gonna see a dramatic difference in that regard. Now, another trick with the detail extractor filter, uh, just to see what it's doing, let's turn that on and off using the checkbox that's to the left of the label. There's the before, there's the after. I think we've still got too much of the effect, although I like what's happening in the reflection quite a bit. Uh, so what we're going to do is apply this sort of relatively subtle trick that I've figured out. And that is if I place the detail extraction at zero, the uh, contrast adjustment at zero, and the saturation adjustment at zero, and then I change the effect radius to large, I actually get a little bit of added texture, and it's this really subtle bump. So watch the difference. There's the before. It's really subtle. Uh, there's the before, there's the after. It's just enough uh, that I, I can't really tell there's a difference. I mean, you can see that as I turn it on and off and we get this nice little subtle extra bit of texture, but it's not like you can really tell that this filter is being applied. So again, here's the before, here's the after. It's just bringing out those little textures and striations in the clouds nicely. Um, if I add too much of the detail extraction, it is going to enhance noise that's in the image, so you do want to be careful of that. But I've got the detail extractor filter and the skylight filter applied. From there, I'm just going to add the Glamour Glow filter one more time because I love what it does. It just takes the edge off of that uh, sort of textured image. And the thing is, is I don't, I don't want the Glamour Glow on the entire photo. I just want it in certain areas that I want to kind of distract you away from. So I'm going to increase the saturation. I'm going to bring that back up. So we're getting this sort of regular about amount of saturation that we had before. And I'm going to take the plus control point and I'm going to place this effect basically just up in the corner and then a little bit down in here in this corner as well. I'm going to also take a minus control point and just place it in the reflection right here because I want to make sure that I'm still getting this really fine texture and tone and maybe even take a minus control point and place it down in here. It's just gonna give me that little bit of contrast. And, and the thing about all of these little adjustments, ladies and gentlemen, is that it, it's basically making these subtle little changes with each one of these filters in this case to kind of uh, bring home the overall look and feel of the photo. In fact, if we look at a side-by-side -side preview, um, let's hide the tool set. So I'll tap tab on my keyboard and that's going to hide that. The original image, which looked pretty good when we opened it up in the first place, is on top and the enhanced image is on the bottom here. And if we added too much saturation back in, we could go and reduce that with the skylight filter. Uh, in fact, let's might as well do that, right? So I'm going to tap the tab key again 
go back to the single image view, and then I'm gonna go into skylight, I'm going to take a minus control point and place it up here in the sky, but instead of leaving the minus control point at 0% opacity, I can actually increase some of the effect. At 100%, we're getting all of that skylight filter added back in. If I reduce this down to maybe 50 or 55%, I'm, I'm getting just a hint of that skylight. Well, I'm getting 50% of it, but I'm getting a, a more subtle kind of control uh, by controlling that control point that way. I'm going to place a plus control point of that glamour glow in the upper left as well. So one last before and after. There's the original capture, and here's the enhanced. I'm going to click that save button in the lower right corner. That's going to bring us back over into uh, Photo Lab 2 in this case, and uh, we'll have our resulting image. And what you're going to notice is that in Photo Lab 2, uh, you have the raw file in the in the film strip down at the bottom. And right next to the, the original image, we should have the enhanced TIFF file. So here's the original file in the bottom portion of the interface. And just to the left of it in the uh, film strip is our Nick software edited image. All right. So I have just one more image that I really want to get into. I think we're coming up on time. We are. I always talk way too long. Um, let me make sure everybody's good to go. We are. I'm just going to move quickly here on this image, and I, I guess I don't even necessarily need to bring it into the Nick collection in this case. I just want to show you that there is U-Point technology built directly into Photo Lab 2. And what this has done for me is made it so that I don't, I don't really use Viveza 2, which is a, a tool that I was using all of the time on a lot of my photographs to selectively dodge and burn different areas in the image and, and control color as well. Um, I don't necessarily need to use it anymore because the beauty of control points of U-Point technology built into PhotoLab is that I'm dealing with the raw data. So I can actually basically click on the local adjustments tool in the top right quadrant of the interface. I'm going to make sure that my control point option is at or is on. And the first time you do this, what you might need to do is actually right click on your image. A little heads up display pops up here where you can choose from a control point an auto mask, which is a brush capability that has an edge detection. You have a graduated filter tool and a brush tool, along with a reset, a new mask, and an eraser tool. In our case, I want to use those control points. They are killer. They are great stuff. And I can see in the histogram in the upper right corner that I have detail in my highlights and I have full detail in my shadows. So there's a lot that I can do here. And what I'll do to start with is just drop a control point in the center of the image. And I want to get more texture and a little bit more tone out of the uh, sky. So I'm going to place the control point. In this case, I'm just going to see what happens when we size the area of influence, which is the circle that's going around the control point, to encompass the entire sky. Uh, if it starts affecting things that we don't want, we can go back in and change the way that it's being masked using control points. I, I'll show you that. I want to do this relatively qu quickly, though little DxO clear view, little structure, and now we're getting that detail out of the sky. Keep it a little bit subtle. And what we were adjusting there were the luminosity adjustments. So this first top part where you see like a little sun right there, that's the luminosity or the brightness and contrast adjustments. Uh, the next one down in the middle is a saturation and color tool. And here's another really cool option. You can selectively change the color temperature uh, with control points, which is crazy. It's nuts. Uh, so I can go and cool down that blue sky. We can make it crazy blue if we want to. Um, anyways, I digress. I don't need to be getting into this with this much detail. Um, what I want to do from here, though, is just keep adding a couple control points here or there. So I'm going to drop a control point in the sort of cement area here. I'm going to go into my Clearview Plus my micro contrast and my exposure, and I'm gonna brighten those values up some. And then I'm gonna go into color and I'm gonna desaturate. I am working a little bit faster than I mean to, but I'm doing that because I wanna have enough time for some questions and I still wanna finish this image. So I've placed my point, size the area here. Let's go ahead and make that water more blue than it is now. And notice what's happening. See, as I adjust that, I've made that area much more blue. I could increase a little bit more saturation, but it's also affecting uh, below 
the, the, the actual water portion, and we don't want that. So in Photo Lab, what you do is you click the minus control point here, and then you place that point on the objects where you don't want the effect. And basically, as you go in and add more minus control points and then control different areas with the regular control point or the adjustment control point, uh, each of those control points is basically going to get smarter and it's going to understand better what you're trying to do and what you're trying to adjust. So I'm going to just add one more control point here. I'm going to add some microstructure, a little bit of clear view. Let's brighten up the highlights a bunch. And then I'm going to just place duplicate control points around the areas where I want them to be applied. Anyways, I think that's enough out of me for our landscape photography uh, workshop here, our webinar. Uh, let's go ahead and transition into a Q&A. I know there's uh, some some questions already added into the into the questions box there. But for those of you um, who who don't want to stay for the the Q and A part, I totally get it. It's 8:02. I've already gone over by two minutes. I greatly appreciate everybody hanging out this evening, and uh, hopefully you got something out of this webinar, whether it was navigating the software or new ideas as to how to use the software, um, or just an introduction to the software. I'm totally cool with all of that. Um, if you do have questions, I'm, I am going to stick around for the next 15 minutes or so, or as long as we really need, and uh, answer as many of these questions as I possibly can. So, uh, Prakash, Prakash, you said, is there a difference between the Nick collection um, with Google and now with DxO? The, there is no sort of operational difference of the actual Nick plugins. Um, between when Google had the software and now that DxO owns the software. The the biggest difference now is that it is going to be supported. They I I have no idea if they're developing new tools. I imagine they aren't going to tell me that as I don't actually work for DxO. I just love the software and use it all the time. Um, so I, I don't know about that, but I do know going forward, it's going to continue to work in contemporary operating systems, and it is now functioning within PhotoLab 2, right? So we can launch from PhotoLab 2, which was super smart, uh, I think, on DxO's part. And having the control point, U-point technology built in is another one. Um, Michael, you said, having color shift problem with Viveza, use Affinity, does a new upgrade correct this problem? Michael, good question. I, I don't know. I actually just found out about Affinity Photo. I actually didn't even know that was a piece of software, and I'm kind of embarrassed about that. Probably shouldn't announce it to everybody here, but I, I'm not sure of, of that. M Michael, what I'm wondering, though, is how what uh, color profile Affinity Pro or Affinity Photo is using, and if Viveza is accepting so I assume what you're, what's happening is that you're in Viveza 2, you're making color adjustments, and then when you click the Save button, you don't get the same looking result in, um, in Affinity Photo. I'm assuming that's what you're getting at. I, I don't know why that would be. So I'm, but I think that that's what you're saying. It sounds like it's just not, Viveza isn't communicating properly with the color space. Um, and I would imagine it just has to do with Affinity Photo and Viveza not playing well. I don't know. I can't say for sure. Um, go over the highlights. Let me upgrade when you're... Oh. Will you go over the highlights to the upgrade and why we're buying version 2? Barry, sure. Yeah, so they're, they're built into all of the new plugins. Not all the new plugins, I'm sorry. Built into Silver Effects, Color Effects, HDR Effects Pro, and Analog Effects Pro. There are at least 10 new presets that are built into the software. And those are the En Vogue presets. Um, there's also support for contemporary operating systems. Uh, the software plugs into PhotoLab 2, which is a huge new improvement. And then also there is a uh, there's support on Windows machines for high resolution displays for like 4K or high pixel density displays so that you have a better experience when using those high res displays. Uh, are there presets available for Adobe Camera Raw? N none of the presets or recipes that are operate within the Nick collection will function in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm not sure if that was a, if that answers your question. Linda, it's great to see you as well. You can see I'm very far back on these questions, so I'm going to work my way down. Uh, Ray, if you do infrared, I would love a webinar on infrared with uh, a filter or images 
shot on a converted camera. Ah, so the, the D800 that I'd shot that infrared image with is a converted camera. It's converted to 650 nanometers. And um, I hope to do a webinar, Ray, hopefully next month with infrared photography. And I'm hoping that it's June, no, sorry, July 25th. I'm not, I'm not sure yet. Um, the question, can I run the Nick Collection 2 with DxO Photo Lab Elite? Steve, absolutely. I'm actually in Photo Lab Elite and it, it should work. It does work within Photo Lab Elite. It just, when you purchase the Nick Collection 2, it comes with Photo Lab um, essentials. Why talk about infrared when the majority of us don't use this, use a regular image? <laughs> Got it. Okay. That was a comment from before. Um, Uh, what is dynamic brightness, Chris? If you're still there, dynamic brightness is a tool in Silver Effects Pro. Let's go ahead and launch Silver Effects Pro here, and I can explain the dynamic brightness capability. I would say, just as this opens, a dynamic brightness is kind of like brightness 2.0. Um, brightness. If you take a brightness slider to the right, it's going to brighten the entire image. Where the heck is my Silver Effects? Oh, there it is. Hopefully. Uh, and the dynamic brightness slider, so the question was in regards to this slider right here. And just to show you visually what it does, the regular brightness slider is gonna brighten all of the values up at the same time and at the same rate, basically. Dynamic brightness is, I kind of call it bright, brightness 2.0. If I take that slider to the right, it's actually going to brighten the dark values more so than the bright values. So you're getting a higher key image, a brighter image, but you're retaining highlight detail. Or if you take a dynamic brightness to the left, it's the opposite. It darkens the image down. It actually darkens the brightest values more so than the shadows. And in this case, you can see how very dirty my uh, camera sensor was. It definitely needed a cleaning at that point. It was This was a shot on a uh, Canon 5D Mark II, geez, around 2012 or so, I think. This is just a fun image that I... Uh, partner with another photo of the same place. Okay, so hopefully that one answers that. Um, let's see. I found that control points bleed the outside of the circle. Is there a way to block the bleed by putting another unadjusted control point or, or boundary circle? Yes. So Ken, great question there. The, Ken's question was in regard to using control points to kind of guard uh, or protect, like a protection control point. And you can, we did that actually in this image using um, PhotoLab 2. And then you can also do that here in Silver Effects Pro 2. So let's say I darken down that brightness, but the control point is bleeding, it's affecting this area, and we don't want this area to be affected. You literally just take another control point, place it in that area, and basically as you add more and more control points, each control point's going to get smarter with the additional control point in its neighbors. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, so I'll scroll down. I think I lost David. Yeah, David didn't like what I was doing uh, to that infrared image. Okay. All right, so I've, I'm, I've got it to the point in the questions where I asked if you guys could still see me or see the screen. So now I'm trying to get back into the questions. Um, John, you said, I did not get a link from the webinars from two days ago as the audio cut out all the time. I was counting on being able to download the presentation. So the, the way that I think this is working, the webinars themselves, is when you sign up for a webinar and you, and you log in, after 24 hours, the email that you logged in with, you should get another email with a link to um, the recorded webinars. If that doesn't happen, if you go to the DxO website, there, there are recorded webinars here. And um, right now we've just got, from, from me anyways, the initial uh, DxO webinar of the Nick Collection. So, oh no, this is the Color Effects Pro webinar that I just did. And I'm gonna have to mention my name is misspelled there, but oh well. Uh, all right. Does the Nick Collection DxO plug into Affinity Photo. Mike, if you're still here, yes, as far as I know, it does. But I found that out through other um, webinar 
folks who, who came in because I actually don't know anything about Affinity Pro or Affinity Photo and I really need to get to know it because it seems like there's a lot of people using it. Um, let's see. What is the workflow of starting from Lightroom? More specifically, how do you use two plugins? Ah, so Eileen, if you are using the software as a Lightroom user uh, and you want to use more than one of the plugins, it's going to work the same way in uh, Photo Lab 2. What you would do is basically, like this image, we processed the raw and then we went into color effects and then we might want to take this photo into, let's say, Analog Effects Pro. What's going to happen is each time you launch the software, a duplicate version of your image is going to be made. And the reason it's doing that is so that we operate in a, a non-destructive workflow, meaning we can always get back to uh, the original image, in this case, uh, the raw file. So here we're in Analog Effects Pro. Uh, um, is there a way to sync settings from one image to similar images, uh, like in a time-lapse sequence? Oh my goodness, that would be such a fantastic feature, Ray. Uh, it, kind of, but not really. So, um, hypothetically, you could probably make a droplet in Photoshop, like an action in Photoshop that launches and does a particular thing, and uh, you could have that exact same thing applied. But there's no, there's no just sort of like software feature built into the software that, that does that. It, it's a good idea for sure, but um, there is no feature that does that right now. Ah, okay, so Steve had a question about using Lightroom and Photoshop and the plugins all together. Uh, so Steve, you know, it's, it's different almost every time for me. Um, if, if I'm dealing with an image that's relatively straightforward and simple, I will use Lightroom. At this point now I'm using Photolab to experiment. I've been processing my whole wedding using it actually. Um, but I would be in Lightroom. I would process the raw file as I saw fit. And then if I only needed to use one NIC plugin and I didn't have to do any masking or using layers and layer masks and stuff, um, I would just go into the NIC plugin and use, let's say, color effects. But if I knew I was going to use more than one of the plugins, I would launch from Lightroom into Photoshop. And then I would use layers and typically layer masks and blending modes, sometimes smart objects um, in Photoshop. And then I would save it as like a PSD file. And then that would repopulate back over into Lightroom. But I would have a layered PSD file along with my original raw file. Uh, hopefully that one answers that. So uh, Christian, you're saying after doing basic and local adjustments in Photolab 2, you normally export to uh, application as DNG. This is preferred optimal way in terms of quality other than exporting directly into the NIC collection as TIP 16-bit. Ah, yeah, so Christian, if you're trying to get a DNG file out of the software in terms of quality and retaining you know, the raw file, that, that's a good way to go. If you wanna get into the NIC plugins, if you're trying to use the NIC plugins, Along with uh, Photo Lab 2, it is a good idea. Let's. I'm going to cancel this. It is a good idea to set your feature or your uh, settings up to use 16-bit per channel TIFF files. Let me show anybody who's interested. So if you click from Photo Lab into the NIC collection, and you go into settings, in settings uh, you can choose what sort of format you want to be dealing with. And in terms of retaining image quality, it's best to process as a TIFF and then use the 16-bit per channel. If you're trying to operate as quickly as possible, you could export as a JPEG and deal with like a relatively low quality JPEG. But I don't advise that for numerous reasons, the most important of which is a 16-bit per channel file is, has a massive amount more information than an 8-bit per channel file. And therefore, as I make changes, I'm going to be able to retain more of that information in that 16-bit per channel file.
How about now? Can everyone hear me? Oh man, I don't know when I missed what happened there. All right. Um, who did the infrared conversion? Shoot, uh, Chris, that was, it was somebody out of um, Massachusetts. They were great. I should remember their name. Light something. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, um, photo, the VESA 2 plus affinity problem not fixed, Thomas said. Okay. So I've got a bunch more questions here. Is is there a library of webinars? So Jane, if there are two webinars right now posted on the DxO website, if you go to YouTube and you search for Nick Software, there's actually a DxO Nick Software official page and there are tons of videos and tons of recorded webinars posted on that YouTube page. There, there's also a lot of other uh, sort of um, um, enthusiasts and actually Nick experts uh, who have recorded content on YouTube as well. Colin Smith was really good, RC Concepcion, um, uh, Ken Kamininski, Elia Licardia, um, Vincent Versace, all of them had great content in webinars in that regard. You can probably even find some of them on the official uh, Nick Software YouTube page. Uh, okay, so I lost audio. It looks like we got it back. Life Pixel, Roman, thank you very much. It was Life Pixel for the IR conversion. And they were fantastic. They answered all the questions. They've got a really great resource on the website. Um, yes, Patty and Renee, Life Pixel. Thank you very much for mentioning that. How are photos saved in DxO? Michael, I'm not sure of the question. Uh, it depends on, I, I think I'm, I try and answer the question. It depends on the setting that you've used um, here within the plugin selector, if you're talking specifically about the Nick collection. If you're not, whatever the file is in your folder structure is what's going to be imported. For example, this is a Nikon RAW file, so it just sits in my DxO um, photo lab sort of library-ish I don't know if you can call it a library technically, because it's not really a library, but it just sits there in whatever the original file format is. Um, and then you can export. So if you say export to application, or if you click this button, uh, you can export directly into uh, these sort of quick exports. You can do export to disk, and you can choose all sorts of different kinds of outputs. Um, thank you, Robert. So, Ray, you said, when you save and close a file, do you lose the history? Yes. So when once you exit whatever the Nick plugin is that you're using, uh, the history state browser is erased. It's no longer there anymore. Good question. It would be another cool feature, but I that would have to get that information would have to be saved as another sidecar file, and then you'd have like three files. You'd have a raw file, you'd have a TIFF file, you'd have the XMP data for the raw file, and then you'd also have a history browser thing from the Nick collection. I think that would just get it wouldn't. It probably just wouldn't be worth it in the long run. Um, does Photolab use sidecar files to save? Yes. Oh, got it, Chris. I see. I think that's what your question was initially. Yes, there are sidecar files. Uh, they're called DOP files. So that's what. If you look at this folder here, these are all the sidecar files from DxO's um, Photolab. Good question, Roman. I recommend the hypercolor conversion and then get the supercolor and IR, black and white external filters. Your camera then gives you three different ranges of wavelengths instead of needing three separate bodies. Roman, great point. I actually, I, I, I almost went for that. Um, and I almost went for the full conversion. And what, what stopped me was at the time I was interested in particular kinds of things. And then also I didn't want to buy a whole bunch of filters. I just got one, I think it's a 77, B, which is you know 720 nanometers or so um, but I think if I were to do another conversion again I would do it with a mirrorless because I did it with a d800 and it was great at the time but it's severely limited compared to what you can do now and um, I probably would get a hypercolor conversion or something like that um, anyways ladies and gentlemen I think that's enough for me uh, for the night I, I, I appreciate everybody sticking around here there's still 107 of you left after um, all of this Q&A. Uh, have an absolutely wonderful weekend, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, hopefully I'll see you again in July. Make sure to stop by and see 
Oh, thank you, Patty. Uh, make sure to stop by and see the webinars list coming up in July as well, and possibly August. You know, come on by and say hello. Thanks again, everyone. Bye bye.